Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. This week, episode 24, Stranger Danger. Father Thomas found Miles fought alone and asked him, I'd like to know what you would have done. Tom, you're gonna have to be more specific than that. But I'll tell you this. If given the knowledge I know now, I would have most certainly stopped watching Lost after season three. If I'd stopped there, I could have loved her till the day I die. Fa's cultural reference went by unnoticed by Father Thomas. As for the father, he hadn't watched anything on a screen since Westworld terrified him when he saw it on his ninth birthday. Jennifer Free. Before she asked me to fill the space to tell her the story, what were you planning on feeding her? Why do you think I had something in mind? Because you always know what happens next. Old Tom, you make it sound like I'm the conniving villain on this boat. I know what you are. Father, must I quote the letter from James to you? Which part? He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Why do you antagonize me? Because you're so easy to knock down. Grow some balls, father. Have some conviction. If I'm the enemy, believe it. If I'm evil, let me know I'm damned. There's always time for change. Is there? I... I will not get sucked into your games. What did you plan to fill into the young lady's head? What was your plan? And why should I tell you? You must tell me. <laughs> yes, yes, I must. Okay, then. If the good priest orders, I was planning on telling her about Elagabalus and his Baedalus. Elagabalus. He was, uh, he was a Roman emperor, yes? Very good, father. Well done. Someone got a fancy education, didn't he? I always liked Roman history. He was, uh... He was pagan. A debauched pagan emperor, yes? Oh, worse than all that, Tom. Elagabalus was as decadent and morally perverse as they come. So why use him? What story does he keep? Uh, well, his ma got him the job. He was the chief priest down in Syria before he became emperor. And when enthroned, he brought his god with him. Yes, I remember now his name, Elagabalus is actually the same name of the god he worshipped, yeah. Are you... are you following Hell's orders, Miles Fa? Why do this? Why fill her mind with such tripe? Oh, that hurts, Tom. I tell her such tripe. Because Elagabalus worshipped his god in the form of a certain black stone, a certain meteorite. He placed that stone in Jupiter's Hall, and then, when the boy king was slain, when Rome returned to her former gods, back to Jupiter in his lot, the stone traveled east. Why is this important, Miles? Miles mimicked and mocked Father Thomas as he responded. You must tell me, Miles, Lucifer's child. You must tell me your secrets. Is that it, Father? Are you ready to plunge a stake into my undead heart? Be serious. Fine. Since you're as dumb as a chinchilla, the black stone of Elagabalus, what we call a Betalus, traveled east where it was venerated by Arabs for hundreds of years. Until, that is, it was exalted by the Prophet Muhammad and enshrined as the Kaaba. But, but, but why, Sir Isaac wanted to go to Mecca? If you're trying to convince Jen to go there, why not just vote it into place? Miles slapped the father on the back, amused. She's gotta go to Mecca, Tom. We all know that deep down, don't we? I'll push her there, but she's not ready yet. Not ready for what? Do you really think you'll live long enough to see what she'll find? Why do you hate me? Your problem, Thomas, is that you act like you're the one writing the script. I don't hate you at all. You see things through a glass darkly, but your fear, fear from God knows what, keeps you from doing what's most prudent. And what's that? Spitting on the glass. Rubbing it clean with your shirt. There's a whole world to see out there. I don't like you, Father, because your petty fear holds you back. You're smarter than all that, but you continue to be a coward. There's... there's things, there's... rules I must uphold. 
Yeah, is that what they teach you in your priest school? Don't use your religion as an excuse for your inexhaustible trepidation. Are you done here, Father? Are you satisfied yet? Or should I hurl some more insults at you? The dream sang through Jennifer's mind like a small play, like a band of performers dressing up for a show on a small town hall stage, with only a dozen or so in the audience. The new dream, the vision that replaced Tiff and Flusher, here, now. This dream world play began like so. Once there was a world that had a kingdom in the clouds. There were many, many different countries that lived in the valleys below, all looked up to the kingdom in the clouds. It was believed that the kingdom was ruled by one of the gods of creation. The great mountain Pelagus, at its zenith, reached up to the high door entrance into the kingdom in the clouds. From time to time, intrepid men teased death by enduring the trek up the mountain. No one ever came back alive. Many bodies were found at the base of the summit, as if pushed down from the kingdom's walls. A rumor circulated among one tribe and over generations became embedded as an eternal truth. The tribe believed that when one ventured to climb Pelagus and reach the god who dwells above, that adventuresome spirit must offer the god a gift. If that god does not approve of the gift, he destroys the climber. But if the gift is accepted, the believer lives forever amidst the kingdom in the clouds. It was further believed that the god who rules there loves only precious stones. There came a time when life became unceasingly difficult, that every soul lifted their eyes to the clouds, imagining a way to gain entrance into the celestial kingdom. The rich men spent their fortunes mining for gems, forever unsure of how many precisely would gain them entrance beyond the gates of splendor. The poor devised schemes to steal what they could not earn. One boy burned with indignation. He sneered up at the heavens hating the gods for damning him to his wretched state. He could never afford to purchase one gem, even if he worked night and day all the years of his life. The boy knew those who tried to steal their way into eternity. They all failed, and worse yet, suffered torture at the hands of the unforgiving courts. The boy took all his anger, all his strife, all his pain, and suited himself up with it. He pinned it to himself like armor. Then he took to Mount Pelagus. His plan was simple. He'd reach the walls of the kingdom, and then once in sight of the god of the realm, he'd punish that god with verbal justice. He'd curse this god for being so cruel, for fixing the universe against the poor, against the needy. The boy was brave, for he knew there was no chance god would hear truth in his angry vitriol. He knew his sentence would be final, but at least, at the very least, he'd go out on his own terms. He wouldn't die a beggar like all the rest. After a long, hard, grueling climb, the boy reached the summit. A knight opened the gates to the kingdom for him. An arsenal of giant guardians marched him to a great room. There, they said, the boy would have his counsel with God. The boy memorized his lines a thousand times. He mumbled them to himself once more as he awaited the king. Then, the king approached. boy fell to his knees. This king, this man, this thing, it radiated more brightly than the sun. The boy collapsed on hands and knees, both in fear and protection, for he couldn't bear to gaze up at the king. The king, for his part, said nothing. All at once, the boy knew he was wrong. Everything he had planned was wrong. This god, he was more beautiful than all the gems and rubies in all the worlds combined. Whatever he asked for from the tribes, it would pale in the sight of this god. The boy knew he was miserable, knew he was wretched, not because of his lot in life, but because he dared to judge and critique that which he never knew. Before the king said a word, the boy bellowed, 
Oh, have mercy on me, O triumphant Lord. I am but a boy. Spare me this day, and I will spend all the rest of my days serving you and bringing you a gift worthy of your beauty. Please, have mercy. Have mercy. Oh, merciful God, have mercy. The king said, Go in peace. The boy left. He walked down the mountain. At first, he dared not tell anyone his story. But over time, he began to tell others that he alone saw God and lived. The boy was always quick to add to his strange story that, indeed, this God is worth all the gems of the world. The boy made it his lifelong duty that no matter what, he'd find enough gems to honor his God and be received past the walls of mercy. Over much time, the boy became a man. He became a miner, then a manager, a landowner, and eventually, a tyrant. The very face of God was ablaze on the boy's heart forever, and with unrelenting zeal, he pillaged the earth for its treasures. He whipped those who failed to impress him. At times, he even whipped them unto death, for how could they know how important this quest was? If only they witnessed the God he saw, they too would work harder. And this hard work, it wasn't merely selfish ambition, but honest loyalty and extreme love. For more than anything in the world, more than wealth, women, or conquest, this boy turned man yearned to see the face of God once more. And at the end of his days, when he was an old, old man, the boy looked at his riches. He'd collected diamonds, rubies, pearls of every color, emeralds, and hardened ambers. Yet, when his eyes cast down on his great wealth, he wept greatly, for it was not enough, and the old boy knew it. He climbed Pelagus one last time. He brought none of the treasure with him. Rather, he gave it to the poor of his birthplace. His back ached, his muscles screamed, his feet bruised black and brown. But he made it. The guardians marched him to the hall of the king like they did before. The boy's heart leapt out of its frame. He'd waited this moment since that first day up on this very hill. When the king appeared, the boy, once more, fell to hands and feet. He cried out, O oh God of gods, oh God of I have gods, no gift for you. No gift. Destroy me now if it pleases you. I'm at peace. I'm at peace. Finally in your presence. This king welcomed the old boy into the kingdom in the clouds where he still lives on to this day. It was never rubies or pearls the king desired. Jen awoke, as always these days, with a smile on her face. This day, she also awoke to Lex's face. Come on, get up. Whole crew meeting. Besides the theater of remembrance and a few meals where everyone happened to attend, Jen wasn't familiar with, quote, whole crew meetings aboard the Orion. As she arose to the deck, it was clearly too early for the likes of Jennifer Dash. It was barely dawn, and there was a dense mugginess to the air that made breathing feel like an exercise in overeating. Everyone was on alert. It looked like Jen was the last to come to. They were, by this point, just a few clicks north of Peru and only two or three days away from making landfall and heading inland in search of the world's quietest room. First mate Gadar started the meeting. About an hour ago, Lizard noticed something on the radar. Soon after, we concluded that it was a ship of some sort, roughly the same size as ours. We tried communicating with the boat, but received nothing back. We suspected their electronics were debilitated or that they were ignoring us. Okay, said the captain. We thought it prudent to connect with them. We set a course to follow the signal. We quickly gained on them. Then... About 20 minutes ago, Gadar and I... Heard a sound. It came with a swift hum. Not too loud, but clearly something foreign. I knew it right away. We found on deck this. Gadar held up an arrow. A real-to-goodness arrow, seemingly sent on a voyage from a bow. Gadar pulled out a scrap from her back pocket. Attached to the arrow was this note. Its message reads in Portuguese, Spanish, and another language I'm not familiar with. Probably a local tribal tongue. Gadar held up the scrap for all to see. Jen couldn't make any sense of the three languages, but that didn't matter. What caught Jen's attention and what refused to relinquish Jen's mind was the form the handwritten note took. It wasn't just scribbled out. 
It wasn't just metered one language, then another, then another. It was written in a circular fashion, the letters starting at one point and spiraling quickly to the edges of the paper. Looking at Jen, Gadar said, It reads, Beware Pishtako and his monster. Stay away from us. We are plagued. You mean, we are plagued, Captain Alf suggested. No, it's written very purposefully. We are plagued. We stalk them, keep our distance, but watch them. We should take precaution, but not be hindered, Merkel said with authority. I agree, said Kadar. They are shooting arrows, people. Arrows. These are not pirates. They aren't military. Our plans to go inland soon. We read the paper about Pishtako. Maybe there's something to it. These ship of fools might just be the intel we need before going shoreside. Lizard, keep us on their heels. Merkel, Robles, can you two fashion a bow and arrow out of whatever you can lay your hands on? Yes, sir. Good. We'll speak to them on their level. Who speaks Portuguese? Lex and Gadar raised their hands. Lizard nodded. Great. Lex, go with the boys and help translate the note. Let's exchange an English translation for their local brand. Got it? What are we going to say? Asked Lex. Captain Alf looked to the stars, hidden by the thick dew of oncoming morn. His composure was one Jen hadn't yet witnessed in the skipper. A look of serendipitous introspection. Right. We've defeated Pish Taco. We've come to aid you. They won't believe us, Lex said. It won't matter. Alf wants to create dissension among them. They've already chosen to alienate themselves from us. The captain wants to fuel doubt in that decision. A coy move, Fa responded. Jen butted in to address Lex. So, wait, what does Pishtako mean exactly? Lex was busy moving below deck, but Robles offered an answer. Pishtako is an old myth that just won't die. A white stranger comes and kills locals, usually because he wants their fat. It's been a recurring fear for the local Indians ever since the Spaniards first came. So, how can a boat be plagued by? We don't quite know the answer to that, Buttercup, now do we? The Orion was a buzz. Everyone had a job to do, and everyone faithfully and without hesitation fulfilled their task. Jen found, somewhere in these intervening minutes, freedom and peace she hadn't yet felt aboard the schooner. She was now truly a cog, an important gear in the operation of this adventure ship. What a thing to be a part of. What an adventure indeed. It didn't take long for the boys to devise a bow and arrow. Giddily, they boasted to the captain that they used the lining of Sir Isaac's door to make the bow. Therefore, heretofore, Isaac's door will never properly shut. It will forever remain ajar. The men, acting like boys waiting for a gold star from their teacher, did not receive the conjoling they were expecting. Rather, Captain Alfred Bacon frowned and informed his rambunctious schoolboys that after this incident came to a conclusion, it would be their duty to fix and replace Sir Isaac's door at once. Overhearing the conversation, Jen couldn't help but recall Lizard's song of experience in which she suggested to Jen that the Captain and Isaac's show of animosity was only surface deep. Maybe she was on to something. It occurred to Jen that the relationships on the Orion were more complicated than she gave them credit for. By nine in the morning, through the thinning fog, the boat Merkel wanted to stock, the arrow-slinging carrier, was in full view. Its appearance was that of a pirate ship. Long and bulwarky, dark wood and dark sails radiated an ominous vibe from its mast to its stern. Most oddly, however, was not the structure of the design itself, but the numerous lines and shapes etched into its wood. Like a paper hijacked by burgeoning fifth-grade mathematicians, the boat had geometric doodles all over itself. These markings immediately conjured images of witches and demon hunters, stories of people that mark their bodies with strange symbols in order to ward off evil spirits. Jin was standing beside Father Thomas as he first saw what lay ahead. Dear God, he whispered. Atop the foreign boat, above its mainsail, the ship's flag was simple, a white outlined right triangle against a black backdrop. Jen perused the boat with her eyes, searching for a boat name. She didn't find one. That is, until Emanuela Godard noted it. It's Pi. The name is the number. She pointed to a series of numbers carved into the dark wood of the stern. <coughs> Robles shot off the Orion's returning arrow. The crew stood in silence, waiting for a response. It 
dawned at once to everyone how very odd it was that not a single soul was visible on the deck of this pie. Binoculars in hand, Captain Alf spied the Orion's message-bound arrow, successfully supplanted near the helm of the ship. For moments, the arrow stood completely solitary, isolated and alone, aboard the geometric ghost ship. There! The captain shouted. A robed figure emerged just long enough to steal the message from the arrow, and return below into shadow. What did he look like? Lizard asked from the wheel. All I could see was a dark rope, Alf called back. Maybe the monks... Merkel suggested, turning towards Father Thomas. So what's next? Lex asked. We wait, said Gadar. Ten minutes later, in the intricacy of the woodwork, of the etchings made, were on full display. Lots of Fibonacci sequences, Lex said. What are those? Jen responded. They're a pattern that keeps showing up in nature. Something like a perfect spiral. Oh, Jen said. She had no clue if there was any real significance to such a sequence or not. Does it mean anything? Does anything mean anything anymore? Lex brushed off. Fifteen minutes later, and the ships were a mere twenty meters apart. Gadar had cautioned Lizard to slow their tracking of the mysterious ship. It was always possible that the strangers were in fact plagued with some sort of disease. There was no need as of yet to get too close and risk subsequent infection. More to that reasoning, this all could be some sort of elaborate plot yet by pirates to use the Orion's fervent curiosity as bait. There's a certain sea snake, Gadar told Lizard, that waits at the bottom of the sea. It acts dead. Its performance is so convincing that it even allows fish to take little bites out of it. It endures such pains to lay the ultimate trap. If this is a trap, it's worth it. Why do you say that? Whoever draws it is someone worth meeting. Heads up! Another arrow. Merkel was the first to it. He unraveled the note, this time three pages worth. It's in Spanish. Only. Give it here. Gadar butted in and snatched up the pages. She translated out loud. Do not come closer. Save yourselves. Set us alight. Set us alight. Please. You must do this. Or your company will be the hell we now experience. Please. Perhaps this is why you've come. Finish us. Set us alight. Let us burn and sink to the depths or our madness will take us further. We want you. We are the plague now. We want you. Get our flip to the second page. We want you. It's wrong. We want you. We want you for hell with us. We want the whole world now. This is the plague talking. Don't you see why you must do this? You must send us to the depths, far from any man. If you don't, We'll die of madness. Or worse, we find land and the world's sorrows won't end. Lizard, turn us around. Put two kilometers between us and them. Do it now. Wait, there's still more, Gadar said as she turned the second page around. Do not welcome Pishtako's monster. She brought the plague into us. Now we want, we want your flesh, your beautiful flesh. The Orion turned around. As it did so, a robed figure emerged from the shadows and dove into the sea. Splashing around like a poison rat, an unspeakable scream gutted out of the rope thing. Oh Jesus, Father Thomas prayed. Be with us this day. Lead us not into temptation, and save us from the evil one. Save us from the evil one. Save us from the evil one. That thing, that hideous shadow creature, screaming mercilessly, was paddling toward the Orion. And, as it did so, a white excrement puddled out into the sea around it. It's... it's dissolving, Miles Foss said in awe. If even Fa was surprised, if even Fa was stumbling over this blasphemous sight, what under heaven was happening? Jen watched, catatonic, at the wretched sight. She did, however, catch Jorge Robles with the periphery of her eyes march quickly below deck. There was something about the way he moved that signaled warning upon warning in Jen's heart. Robles knew something, something that scared him. 
Look! Lex cried. Instantly, two dozen robed figures appeared on the deck of the pie. If only it were a sunny day, their features would have been brought to light. If only the sun were shining, Jen could be reassured that these beings were indeed just mortal men, not a brood of witches and warlocks. One of the robed creatures raised a bow and arrow. Instinctively, Jen ducked, fearing the alien colony was about to wage medieval war on her. She rose just as suddenly as the horrible scream ceased, just in time to see the top of the monster's head as it sank into the Pacific. An arrow nestled stiffly through its head. They had shot their own. Maybe it was mercy. The creature appeared to be melting in the sea. Maybe it was mercy. Or maybe it broke the rules by jumping overboard. Or maybe they were stopping it from swimming to the Orion. Maybe the note was telling the truth. Maybe the ship had turned into a house of flesh-craving ghouls. Maybe. Then... The robed ghoul crew of Pi removed their robes from their heads, revealing their true nature. The Orion jerked. Lizard had cut the engine and was promptly rerouting the boat back towards the strangers. She was experiencing a song of innocence. She wailed with surprise and glee. They look like me! The high people! Tis true my form is something odd, but blaming me is blaming God. Could I create myself anew? I would not fail. Tis true my form is something odd, but blaming me is blaming God. Could I create myself anew? I would not fail in pleasing you. Hey. Thanks for listening to Solve the World this week. I'm Dante Stack, and I write, produce, edit, record everything about Solve the World. Uh, so I just want to thank you for listening this week and invite you to join our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash solve the world podcast. Or as always, download us at iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find podcasts or our website at dantestack.com. By the way, all the sound effects and music you hear in this program and every other episode of Solve the World are labeled under Creative Commons licenses, and full attribution for those sound effects and music can be found on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. Thanks again for listening. Please, if you like the program, share it with others. We need this podcast to grow so that we can continue to tell Jen's story. Thanks. See you next week. Hello, I'm Josie from the southwest of England. I've listened to all 100 episodes of Jen's story. It started with a blip on the radar, then a cryptic message arrived by Arrow, then a shadowy boat with geometric designs scored into the panels of its side, a right triangle flag, the infinite number Pi as the flagship name, a long message of fear and loathing and madness, a manic dive into the water, screams and dissolving flesh ending with an arrow in the head. Yes, this day has brought surprises to the crew of the Orion, and they shall not leave this encounter untouched. Each member of Jen's boat has their own worries and intrigues about these new strangers. Captain Alf sees a welcomed opportunity to divert course. Who knows, maybe this new adventure will lead the hearts of the crew back north, back to where he feels they all belong. Goddard senses a connection of the fabled pistachio to real lost history. She'd rather investigate the past than be stuck engaging with her self-destructive conscience in the quiet room promised to come. Merck was left wondering what intoxicating nerve agent could wreak such havoc on the body to force it to have such a remarkable reaction to salt water. Lex wonders if this monster and Pishtaco fit into her ever-widening worldview of cryptozoological realities. Lizard thinks she's found a homestead of like-minded diseased people. Miles Farr is afraid. This encounter was unexpected. Father Thomas knows demons when he sees them. Sir Isaac is despondent that his door's been disassembled. And Jorge Robles is about to make a life-altering decision. Jennifer Dash will have to respond to all of these mirad reactions of her crew members. That and more, next time on Solve the World.
Oh, my God. 